Hello, everyone. We are so grateful at this time to be a part of Project Pray television program. And it's that time of the year when we're so grateful, too, for Thanksgiving to be right around the corner. You know, one of the first things that I learned when I was in first grade was the Psalm 100. Psalm 100 says, Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Know ye that the Lord, he is God. It is he that hath made us, and not we ourselves. We are his people, and the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving, and into his courts with praise. For the Lord is good, his mercy is everlasting, and his truth endureth to all generations. That number four verse, enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his name. It's a wonderful time, Thanksgiving. And one of the things that I always remember when we get together at my house is the baking, the fruit cakes, the pumpkin pie, the cookies, it's just such a wonderful time and everybody is so excited and you can't hardly wait for the dinner to be done and uh, big turkey uh, and you, you're, you're waiting for everybody to get there and the doorbell rings and you're so excited because, oh, it's Aunt June, it's Aunt Mary, it's Uncle John. Oh, wow, look. And you're just so excited because everybody's there and then you all sit down and you sing a song and you're thankful for different things. Come ye thankful people come. Come ye thankful people come. Raise the song of harvest home. It's harvest time also. All to safely gathered in ere the winter storms begin. God our maker doth provide. And he does. This is a time when we're thankful for the provision of God. For our wants to be supplied. Come to God's own temple, come, raise the song of Harvest Home. And then there's always the other one, and I was just talking about that. We gather together to ask the Lord's blessings. He chastens and hastens his will to make known. The wicked oppress now cease from distressing. Sing praises to his name. He forgets not his own. A long time ago, there was a, a, a young lady that uh, was very excited about this time of the year. Her name was Lydia Marie Child. She was also always, also just absolutely overwhelmed and excited about the time of Thanksgiving. So much so that she wrote a song. It's over the river and through the woods. Remember that song? It's over the river and through the woods to grandmother's house we go. The horse knows the way to carry the sleigh through the white and drifted snow. Over the river and through the wood, oh, how the wind does blow. It stings the toes and bites the nose as over the ground we go. Over the river and through the woods to have a first rate play. Hear the bells ring, ting a ling. Hoorah for Thanksgiving Day. Over the river and through the wood, trot fast, my dapple gray. Spring over the ground like a hunting hound, for this is Thanksgiving Day. Over the river and through the wood and straight through the barnyard gate. We seem to go extremely so. It is so hard to wait. Over the river and through the wood. Now, grandmother's cap I spy. And it's so wonderful because most times you are either around an aunt's home or a grandmother's home. But you know, Thanksgiving is also a sacrifice. And it's a sacrifice of Thanksgiving. And in the Old Testament, we read about that. In the Psalms, it says, Offer to God a sacrifice of Thanksgiving. Call upon me in the day of trouble. I shall rescue you and you will honor me. They had a complicated list of rituals and sacrifices to follow. Of the five special offerings, one was the peace offering or the sacrifice of thanksgiving. It's not always easy to be thankful. 
in times of great difficulty when everything in the natural screams, I don't like this. Gratitude comes at a very great sacrifice. It's a denial of the natural response, dying to one's own preference and in submission saying, God, your way is the best way and I submit. So let's pray. Lord, today I want to say thanks for being my God and for the grace that you show me each day. As I call out to you, I know you will be my deliverer and you will get all the glory in the process. Thanksgiving is a time to be thankful. So remember that. Be thankful even if you have to sacrifice for Thanksgiving. God bless you and happy Thanksgiving. We'll be right back. That was a great opening, uh, Barbara. Um, you know, there are, uh, we get bored when we read Leviticus. Yeah. <laughs> Everybody sleeps through Leviticus. Uh, but Leviticus really is a rich book if you understand the, the symbolism. And in the first five uh, chapters in the first part of the book, it appears to be bloody because it's uh, the sacrifices. Mm -hmm. And as you said, you linked Thanksgiving with sacrifice. Yes. And you linked Thanksgiving specifically with the peace offering, which is Leviticus 3. It's it's the burnt offering, which is what Paul has in mind when he says, I beg you, brethren, that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice. This is the burnt offering. It's not an offering for sin. It's the offering of myself, my total consecration to God. And then Leviticus 2 is the meat or meal or grain offering, which you get from the harvest field. So that is the my labor presented as an offering to God. So it's one thing to worship God on Sunday. It's another thing to work for God on Monday or to take God to work with you or to see that your work is sacred. Yes. Uh, which is the whole idea of the marketplace ministry that's going on in the nation today. And the, then Leviticus 3 is the peace offering or the fellowship offering. Now, those are offerings of consecration. In Leviticus 4 and 5, it's as if he puts the first last, because the first thing you have to deal with, Leviticus 4, sin, and then Leviticus 5, trespass. Trespass is the sin that hurts you or the yes. sin that hurts him or her. It, it demands an offering of reparation. All right. So here's the offerings of reparation, Leviticus 4 and 5, um, sin and trespass. But then on that basis of repentance and the fruits of repentance, you consecrate yourself to God. And the, and again, a lot, a lot of words here to get back to what you were saying so simply. The crowning offering is the thanksgiving offering. The peace offering. The peace offering, also called the fellowship offering. Right. It's the only offering at the altar, at the tabernacle of the temple, where you got a portion back. And so the altar, which was taking, sacrificing, is now giving. And that's really a symbol of prayer, because if, if you go to prayer, the first thing that happens in prayer is that you is that you, uh, you, you it crunches the flesh and you spend time with the holy God and you become uncomfortable with that holy God. Mm -hmm. And uh, and you, you think you're OK. And the more you spend time in prayer over an open Bible, the more you see that you need to repent of. You need to change. This morning, I, I went into my little prayer closet to. Uh, not very early, I think it's around six o'clock, but immediately when I got there, I, I opened the Bible and I began to, to pray and and immediately I'm 
I'm prompted by things in my heart. It's like the cobwebs that you've got to pull out of your heart in the corner, the things that grow overnight. And you've got to clean up, clean up your life. But all of that aside, if you do that, if you're diligent, before you end prayer, you end up having dinner with God. You end up being fed by God. The altar becomes a table and it fills you up. And so, and so, um, let me see if I can say it in a different way. You said it well. Uh, you said uh, Thanksgiving is sometimes a sacrifice. Until we make peace with God mm-hmm. about how our life is going, and we are able to thank Him in the middle of deprivation, want, hurt. We just came back from a funeral. Yes, we did. A sad one. And and yet, it was a happy one. It was happy. But it was, but it was three months ago the diagnosis came. Yes. And this prominent Christian leader who is in the prime of his life, uh, impacting not only a hundred churches in his district where he was the overseer, but um, churches across thousands of churches across the whole movement is is taken away. And you 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 just think, how can that be? It's just not it doesn't it's not reasonable. It's not it's not how can that be? And until you're able to make peace mm-hmm. with yes. the distorted nature of living in a fallen, broken world where things are not like they should be. And they will never be perfect. And life has corners and edges that are sharp. Until you're able to somehow make peace with that, you really haven't, you haven't, you haven't mm-hmm. prayed well until you've come to a place of peace. And you can't pray until you have peace because you pray out of peace. You pray yourself to peace and then you pray out of, out of, uh, out of peace. This is Project Pray, by the way, Project Pray TV. But we're not about we're not about uh, step one, two, three to your miracle. There is a miracle. God does oh, miracles. Yes, He does. God answers prayer. God heals people. Yes, he there does. are wonderful stories, but not. But there are times that you walk away from a fresh grave and you don't understand it. Exactly. And you still have to find in your heart the perspective of God as good to be able to go on with life and to give thanks and gratitude to him, because this is really the heart of our, I need to take a breath, the heart of our witness, (laughs) the heart of our witness here. But God knows our hearts and he knows that we do, that we are grateful and we are thankful for everything that he does. I mean, we have promise after promise after promise after promise in his word that really reminds us of who he is, of his greatness. I mean, we have trees and flowers and green stuff and blue skies and water. And, and no other no other, no other, other planet in this uh, solar system and, or any that we know of like this. No. And so we're always grateful. You know, we don't want to just be thankful at Thanksgiving. We want to always be thankful because he is such a good God. He supplies our needs. He said he would never leave us nor forsake us. And we have to be aware of that. And when we are, when those troubled times come, we're able to fall back on those promises that he has given us that gives us peace and gives us understanding and wisdom about the difficult time that we might be going through at that time. You know, I was thinking, um, and if you look in Genesis, you'll see the phrase over and over, and it was good, 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 six times. And then after the creation of man, the Bible says, and God said, it was very good. Now, this is a conversation going on in the divine council of heaven in the Trinity. It was good. 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 It's very good. Adam is created. Eve is created at the end of the sixth day. The seventh day is their first day. So God has been at work when they have not even existed. They are not in existence yet. And God is working to create a world for them. And that is true of you. Yes. Before you were born, God was working to create a world 
for you. But here's the problem. Adam and Eve couldn't see the good. Mm -mm. They couldn't say what see what God had given. Mm -mm. They could only see what was not permitted for them. And if you end up only seeing the bad, only seeing what is not permitted, you're not permitted to have that or hold on to that person, or that person doesn't live, or or, or that house you can't live there, or that job, or or whatever. Whenever you cannot see the good and the goodness of God, you are no longer grateful. And that becomes the catalyst for the first sin. The inability to see God as, let me use another word, as a loving God mm. and a caring God. We don't have a faith problem when we pray. We've got a love problem. Amen. Because if, if you are praying to a God that you feel like is holding out on you, if you're praying to a God who you don't see as good, fundamentally good toward you, mm. you don't understand that he loves you. You feel like you are somehow the exception that you've fallen through the cracks in some way. You'll never have faith. You cannot have faith mm-hmm. in a God that you don't believe loves you. you. And so you don't have a faith problem. You got a love problem and you got a perspective problem because you don't see the goodness of God. And so, as you talked about the sacrifice of Thanksgiving, there are times that you embrace the discipline of thanksgiving. Mm -hmm. You make yourself, in order to wake up a cold heart, you make yourself review all the things that you mentioned, the green grass and and autumn leaves and the colors and the fact that the sky is still blue and, and I can breathe. You make yourself, I've got four limbs that are still active. I've got two eyes. I can still see reasonably well out of those eyes. You make yourself review all the things. You count on your fingers, take off your shoes, count on your toes, and do it all over again four or five times until finally, until finally, you take a deep breath and you say, what a God. And you've moved from thanksgiving to praise. Amen. Because thanksgiving focuses upon what God is doing for me, but praise focuses upon who God is. And suddenly you are filled with praise language. Hallelujah. And yes. then you run out of praise language. And, and now you move from thanksgiving into praise, from praise into worship, and you're lost in the wonder of who he is. Because worship is ultimately wordless. It's on the other side of words. It's when you can't say anything. Mm-hmm. It's when you're caught up in that awfulness of God, the awe of God. And then you sense his presence. And the clearest indication of his presence is his love. And with that comes peace and joy. Love, peace, and and Joyce, so if you're having a tough time, yes, mm. and you're just wanting to pray all that away, what God would really like for me to do and for you to do is settle down in the mess of the storm and the tornado and find something to be thankful for, to see some level of goodness even in the tragedy, even in the difficulty. You can call it seeing the ha- uh, cup half full and not half empty. However you do that, but somehow, somewhere in all of that, there is still the signature mm-hmm. of redemption, of the goodness of God. We live in a war-ravaged world. We live yes, in a war a world that has not made peace with God. Mm-hmm. God has come. God, God offered us the kingdom, and we turned it down. We crucified yes. the Son of God, and there's not another Son to come. There's not another. Yeah. We made war with God, and because we killed His Son, we mm-hmm. still have not said to God as the earth collectively, as cities, even His families, sometimes as churches, we're sorry for what we did. We were wrong. We were dead, dead wrong, and we're sorry for what we for what we did. And you see, 
what you do is you make peace with that God. And you say, God, I don't understand what I'm going with through right now. But I know that you came looking for me in your son. And I have found that peace. And though this storm right now is affecting that peace, I want to make peace with you again yes. and declare that you are in the, in the middle of this. You're still a good God. Yes. And that focus of thanksgiving in the middle of difficulty and pain leads to praise and praise leads to worship and worship leads to the wonder of his love mm -hmm. and his grace. And that gives you strength to get up and walk out of whatever you're going through. Mm -hmm. We've gone long on this segment and they're waving at us here and saying you're overtime, but <laughs> Uh, you know, we had a friend, uh, I don't, Betty and Larry J, they've, they've both gone on to be with the Lord, but Betty came to my door one day and uh, there was a problem. And she said, and I said, well, Betty, what are you going to do? She said, it's not my problem. It's God's it's problem. problem. I'm not worried about it. And, and I will always remember that steadfast faith that she had that she didn't worry about anything. She just said, well, you know, I'm God's child and it's not my problem. It's his problem. So uh, I've come over and she brought me a cake that day. She said, I baked the cake and I just wanted to bring this over to you. And I'm thinking, she baked the cake amidst all this problem that she had. And she was thinking about others. And she said, no, it's not my problem. And that may be one of the, sec that may be one of the secrets is that, you, is that we, we so focus on ourselves. Mm. Let's stop and pray. Yes. For people who might well, pray for us, Barbara. Father, we are so grateful. We love you, Lord, with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, because that's what you said you wanted us to do. We always put you first in everything that we do. We know, God, that without you, we are nothing. We can do nothing. But through and by your word, all things are possible. <laughs> and we're so thankful, yes. Father. We are so yes. grateful and thankful. And we pray, God, for the people that are watching on this program this very day that might be walking through something that's very, very difficult. And yet they need to lay aside and they need to not think about the problem, but go to God and say, God, I can do nothing else. Only you. You are the only one that can move in this situation. And we're praying, God, for that individual or individuals. It might be many. It might be few. It might be only one. But, God, you know who they are and where they are. So I pray, God, right now that you would touch them, bless them, anoint them. You said you would never leave us nor forsake us and that you would give us the very desires of our heart. And you also said that you had a great supply of everything that we needed and your supply never runs out. So God, would you touch them and bless them and help them right now in the name of your precious son, Jesus, we give you praise in Jesus name. Amen. So if you've got a need, you want someone to pray with you. There is a special number. Uh, there's a prayer line and you can call it. You'll see it from time to time on this program. It's our hope line. And 24 hours a day, somebody is there yes. to receive your call and they'll pray for you. And I just want to say again, you know, one of the things about the ironic blessing was that the priest was always to say, the Lord bless you and keep you or guard you yes. and make his face. May you know he's smiling at you and give you peace. Yes. So our prayer for you in the middle of this program, yes. in the middle of what you're going through, maybe the loneliest Thanksgiving you've ever had. Yes. May, you may not have the turkey and all the festives and the people coming in, but the Lord is with you and he loves you and Amen. he cares about and Amen. he cares about you. This is Project Pray. And uh, we do schools of prayer, prayer impact Sundays all over the nation and around the world. You can find us at uh, www.projectpray.org. You can find our books and materials at Alive Publications. You can Join us every Sunday morning where I open the Bible for Sunday morning manna, learning to pray the Bible, 8 o'clock on Sunday on social media channels of Project Pray or Project Pray YouTube. What am I missing? Every, Sunday, our prayer time on Saturday night. Every Saturday night, one of our board members, Arnie Clem, leads a prayer meeting for the nation, 8.30. They're praying for a state, 9 o'clock Eastern time. They're praying for the nation for spiritual awakening 
in the nation. Uh, and we have people joining us from all over the nation. All over the nation. And, and, and we, sometimes other parts of the world. Oh, yes. We had them from Pakistan. We had them from uh, Guyana, Africa. Oh, yes. that You know, South America. We've had them from all over the world. And ordinary people are praying for spiritual awakening, for spiritual awakening in the, uh, in the nation. Uh, there are movements of prayer that are taking place. I want to tell you, show you a video about a 96, 97-year-old man who he feels like God said, I'm going to let you live till you see a spiritual <laughs> awakening. And this is prayer going on in North Carolina. He started trying to get a thousand people to pray. And then I think he ended up with almost a million people online who say, we want to join you in praying on the mountain for a spiritual revival to come man. to America. So watch this, watch this special video. Brother Fred, how long have you been thinking about spiritual awakening and even more, how long have you been praying for a spiritual awakening in this country? Well, it's been a burden on my heart for, for a long time, many years, of course, even from the time of World War II when I was in Europe uh, during the Battle of the Bulge and all that, and even praying then. But the intensity of prayer as I know it now for spiritual awakening occurred, actually it will be two years ago sometime in the summer. I have a little prayer garden that I go and pray every day, and, and there I was praying and I had an experience with God that's beyond measure. Beautiful sunshiny days, and I looked at Buckhorn Gap and and Gap in the Mountain. I'd been there many times. It seemed to me that I saw Jesus standing in that gap. And just then I saw a thundercloud come up behind him, start rolling over the mountain, and then I heard the thunder roll and lightning begin to flash. And, and uh, I began to talk to God in a furious manner. I said, Lord, I, I'm old and things are about over with me, and now my wife's been gone for several years now, and she's in heaven. And I think it's just time to take me on. I'm ready to go. God said, not yet. Why not yet? He didn't answer me. I kept going back every day for maybe three weeks or a month before one day he answered me. And he said, uh, not yet, because I've got some unfinished business that you need to take care of. What is that unfinished business? you are be preaching 70 years now. Celebrate 70 years in the ministry and get everybody you can to begin praying for spiritual awakening. I want to send a renewal. I want to send a new work among you and do that. And so I started. That's when I first got the tremendous burden for spiritual awakening among us. God has continued to put that upon me, and I'm continuing to say to everybody I see, pray for spiritual awakening among us. And so you've been doing that now uh, for two uh, years. Almost two years, yeah. And uh, this prayer garden, uh, it's two miles away from your house. Yeah, about two miles, yeah. And you go there every day. Yeah. And you ask God to send a spiritual awakening. Yes, yes. And when we came to visit you the other day, uh, did you see that as uh, a part of the answer to prayer? Because we came telling you, as several preachers that came to visit you, that God was stirring in our hearts and had begun to awaken something in our hearts towards spiritual awakening. Are you beginning to see that among uh, not only us, but some other preachers? Yes, I am. Uh, I've been telling people ever since that occurred, that was one of the greatest manifestations of the Holy Spirit that I've experienced in a long time, as we all sat there in that vehicle. And I looked over at you, 
and you said you are seeing your prayers answered right before your eyes. We were honored to be there, and I don't know that I have ever experienced anything like it. And as a matter of fact, on our way back, we tried to process it and talk about it, but it was hard for us to wrap our minds around that kind of a manifestation of the presence of God. It was just so real. You know, the, the automobile could hardly contain us. And, um, and, and so I called you the next morning. I, I just still had to talk about it. You said that you had already been talking to God and that God had spoken to you and that you wanted to do it again, but you wanted to do it back on top of the mountain up there. Uh, and for us to get as many preachers as we could to come on top of that mountain and maybe call it praying on preachers, praying on the mountain for a spiritual awakening. And you truly believe in your heart that if we will humble ourselves and repent of our sins and seek God, that he'll do that again. Well, God said he would. He said he would. He don't lie. And I believe it with all my heart. You know, we can only imagine what that would have been like to see not just 100 preachers, but we had 200 preachers registered to go over on that mountain and pray. This is just one of multiple movements like this going on all over the nation of pastors coming together, of hunger, of denominational walls breaking down, of this passion, of this realization that the only thing that will save this nation now is a great awakening. Great awakening is not just a revival. A great awakening is when the awareness of God's presence breaks out in a whole community. And, uh, and even those who are not believers become convinced that God is real. There's conviction of sin, not because somebody's preaching against it, but because the Holy Spirit himself is convicting men of sin and convincing them of righteousness. We have not seen anything resembling a great awakening in a long time in America. The closest thing to it was the Jesus movement, uh, and along with that, the charismatic renewal that really happened in churches, more than it had happened widespread in the community. We've had a number of, of revivals that have broken out in the recent years, but they've been contained to the local, to the local area. A great awakening is when, is when typically in the past, 7 to 12 percent of the population experiences a renewal with God. Uh, the first great awakening, some estimates are 12 to 15 percent of the population was renewed. And that is enough to bring the shock of righteousness and holiness to uh, the nation. We need a great spiritual awakening. And what what these brothers from Mud Creek Baptist and what Fred is talking about, this 97, 98-year-old Baptist preacher is talking about, is a movement of prayer, a rising crescendo of prayer that will not be satisfied until God comes and changes the community. One of the things that we're asking you to do next May, Pentecost Sunday, 2023, you've got plenty of time to think about this is open your church, not for an evangelist-led revival, not for a music-based revival. Just open your church and invite people to come and pray Wednesday through Sunday, Pentecost Sunday. We're, we're wanting to see thousands, tens of thousands of churches across the nation opened for prayer. Put the scriptures up, put soft music on, uh, put the needs of the community up. Just let people come in on their way to work, drop by at lunch, drop by later in the day, and just pray. Wouldn't it be something to come to the church and not find it locked? Our churches are locked. From, from Sunday to Sunday, they're locked. Wouldn't it be wonderful to find the church open and, and to find people, two or three, a dozen, praying on their face, crying out, to hear a muffled voice there or, or to hear a wail, the sound of wailing there as we lifted up the voices, our voices to God and prayed for lost loved ones to be saved. I want to show you this video and challenge you to become a part 
of next May's prayer movement, particularly the Open Your Church prayer effort in May 2023, the last weekend of May, Pentecost Sunday. What if congregations across our nation, all of us, opened our doors for prayer on the same weekend? What if thousands of sanctuaries were filled with people praying throughout the day, gathering in the sanctuary, sitting, kneeling, standing, waiting, listening in holy space? No formal service, no sermon, no teaching, just the invitation to meet with God and pray. Soft music, scriptures on the screen laced with needs for prayer for a broken world. What if all over the nation before work in the morning, people stopped at their church to pray and fasting lunch, they dropped by again to pray. And on their way home, they gathered and perhaps lingered, waiting, listening, It may be that God is more interested in talking to us than we are to Him. You see, our nation is in trouble. The signposts indicate that we are nearing a point of no return, that is, without the intervention of God. We desperately need what only God can send, a great national spiritual awakening. And there is the promise, if my people worshipfully seek me, embrace humility, repent, and change their behaviors, the nation can be saved. Such change begins with the people of God. You see, we're not just in trouble, we're in trouble with God. It's time to pray. Imagine your church and other churches all over the nation Wednesday through Sunday, Pentecost weekend. No brand, no program, any congregation, all denominations, people meeting with God. You know, a prayer meeting changed everything in Acts 2. God's Spirit energized the church. The city was impacted. Thousands were converted. Gathered nations heard the message. And again, as in Acts 2, the nations are here. And a spiritual awakening would not only energize our congregation, it could impact our cities and perhaps affect the globe itself. It's so simple. Open the doors of your church. Invite the people to come and pray. Let's do it together all across the nation. Pentecost weekend, America's prayer meeting. Well, we had a great time with the Koreans last year. We opened uh, the churches all across the nation for the Koreans to come and pray, and it was an exciting time. We had about 10, uh, 10, there were 20 teams of 10 that came, and they were in 20 different churches across the nation. And they had such compassion and they prayed with such love for us. They loved us. They loved us so much that they came to pray for us. And it was an exciting time. And we're so grateful that they did come. And um, one of the things that impressed me was when they uh, got together, they held hands, they locked hands, but not just them together. They joined us in arm in arm. They were a part of who and what we were doing. We have this great need, as Doug said earlier, for a great awakening. And that's what they came to pray for, the great awakening. That will, I promise, I feel in my heart and soul, this is going to take place. I was thinking as they were praying in these different places, I saw a, a, a city, as it were, or a nation, as it were, and the incense is rising 
out of all of those different places and it comes up into one great big thing right up to God and God has said where is that coming from oh that's over in Texas mm. wow that's over in uh, North Carolina you know that's what I feel like God is smelling this incense and he is so excited God is excited about these prayers that these Koreans are doing. And we just are so grateful for them coming. You know, um, it, it really is extraordinary that a nation, South Korea, because we see ourselves as a missionary sending nation, the second largest missionary sending nation in the world is South Korea. And here they have taken on a three-year project to pray for America and spiritual waking in America. They're sending these teams of intercessors. They believe that there is um, something to be said for leading with prayer. Frankly, we, we put emphasis upon what we do and we pray to make what we do better. Uh, but they believe that the power is in what God does and that somehow, uh, somehow, Something happens in prayer that doesn't happen in any other way at any other time. And so this is a mega church, a Presbyterian church in Seoul, Korea, that sent uh, 200 and, um, goodness gracious, 20, 30, 40 um, uh, prayer missionaries all over the nation. And next year, they'll send 40 teams. They'll come the first week of May, and, uh, and they will be, uh, right now the plans is that all 40 teams will come here to Charlotte, meet at the Billy Graham Center, then be dispersed out across the nation and come back. We are still processing what team, what cities get these teams. We're receiving applications from churches and clusters of churches, from denominational offices and from others that want to host one of these prayer missionary teams. Amen. They've worked in a hundred nations of the world, a mm. hundred nations of the world in some dark places. And they've seen significant revival movements. That's what we're praying for here in America, for a significant revival movement to take place. So all of May next year will be dedicated to prayer and spiritual renewal. That's who we are here at Project Pray. We're yeah. trying to foster a great awakening climate in the nation. At the same time, we produce prayer resources to help local churches become houses of prayer Amen. for for the nations. Those Amen. two things are what we are what we do. Yeah. So next year, first week of May, the week of the National Day of Prayer, forty teams will come from South Korea and be dispersed out across this nation to pray. They'll join praying churches and praying pastors and praying cities for a mighty move of God. And the entire month of May will be given to prayer. And then at the end of the May, as you saw earlier, we're asking you to open your church. Just go to your pastor and say, could, could I be the sponsor to open the church in, in the morning, at noon, and night for people just to come and pray? And we're not having a prayer service. We're no. just letting people come and pray. Put the needs up on the screen and uh, the music, the scriptures. Give people a prayer guide. And let people pray and make it more than prayer requests. Make it about praying for revival in your city, for a mighty move of God in your city. We're going to show you right now. And by the way, if you want to help us with this project, this is not an inexpensive project. No, it's about a million and a half dollar budget that we need uh, to accomplish uh, this uh, national call to prayer uh, next year. So, so consider giving a a significant gift and a small gift to help us with this uh, with this project. But we're going to show you one of the clips from the prayer team's visit this past year.
You know, I can't get over how they, these uh, people pray with uh, passion. Uh, they pray, uh, they use the Korean method of prayer, which is everybody praying aloud together, shouting out to the Lord. They, they believe that, that, um, that this kind of out loud, passionate prayer uh, has special meaning with God. And of course, we know it isn't volume. But I think from, from an evangelical point of view, and even as Pentecostals, we, we've learned to subdue our prayer so much that our prayer lacks, our prayer lacks passion. And, um, and I'm, I'm always moved when I'm with them because of the passion with which they, uh, the passion with which they, they pray. That does not negate the fact that we can still be quietly praying, have our devotional time as we often do at home and we pray and seek God quietly. And so we don't want to, to make people think that this is the only way. There are many different ways yeah. to seek the face of God. And this is the one that they have chosen because they are so, number one, concerned about America. Number two, they're concerned about the church. And number three, they're concerned about the people that are in America. And so they have chosen the forceful, loud, passionate praying that they do. But God sees every way that you come to him. But there is a history that they have of deep angst, of being overrun, of being a nation of poverty, numbered among African nations, of being dominated by Japan, of being divided, still divided by a, um, a war, by being threatened with communism 15 miles from where this sponsoring church is, the DMZ uh, border. Korea. And that has put within them a certain level of, uh, of, of passion. And as a result of that, they've seen this nation rise to the 10th largest economy in the world. And they and they, here's their message. If God could take our little nation, our broken nation, yes. our beleaguered, beaten up, dominated nation that's, that's uh, dominated by all these other uh, countries, and he could raise us up to a place of, of freedom and, and, and uh, blessing, then he could do that in America and he can do that anywhere in the world. And that has become, that's a part of their passion. And the most important thing in, in praying is not what we say to God, it's that God might say to us, say something to us. And that's certainly what we want to hear him, uh, hear him say. One of the things that we do in training is we do a school of prayer every week. Yes, we do. And Doug has been doing Transforming Your Personal Prayer Life. And this book, if you put in the code TPPTV, you can get this book, which is normally about $20. You can get it for 10 Just put in the code TPPTV and order it from a lot of publications, and you can get it. But Doug has done a marvelous job in transforming your church, uh, your personal prayer life, uh, School of Prayer on Wednesday evening at 6 p.m. And it's a social media outlets, uh, Project Pray Facebook site, and also uh, and also YouTube. And one of the other books that we've been promoting this this uh, uh, this month is the New Apostolic Epic, 95 Theses for a Reformation of the Church. And we'll talk more about that in another uh, in another program. But here's a trailer on this book, and it is also available for a special discount this month. 500 years ago, Luther 
nailed 95 Theses to a church door in Wittenberg, Germany. It was October 31, 1517. And on the 500th anniversary, hundreds of global leaders gathered in Castle Church to remember that moment. Just outside Heron Hut at a working farm, a bed and breakfast, I was awakened at 4 a.m. Heron Hut is where the 100 year prayer revival took place. I went downstairs and I began to write as fast as I could and the words that came to me were these, I am about to thrust the church into a new apostolic epoch. This new apostolic epic involves the church becoming a house of prayer for the nations. But this is not the mere amplification of prayer, the addition of prayer to what we're doing, or even the deepening of prayer. We're talking about a seismic shift. It means moving from being church-centered to Christ-centered, from being spectators to participants, players, from being passive to active, from pulpit pew engagement to the church gathered around the pulpit altar table, taking the bread of life to the nations. The new apostolic epic begins with a new 95 thesis. It's a book designed for leaders and Christians that want to recalibrate their values, rethink their purpose, move towards becoming a missional church to join the Lord to join God who is already on mission. He wants us to not merely contribute to the Great Commission, He wants us to complete the Great Commission in the spirit of love and care, the Great Commandment, out of the energy of the Great Commitment. Pray for men everywhere that all men would be saved, all to the glory of God. Two hundred and forty-five years, that's quite a record for a democratic republic. What an inspiration you have been around the world. A champion of freedom, a refuge for the oppressed. You have fed the world and rushed to their aid when famine and pestilence threatened their populations. You have rallied to the aid of other nations around the globe, both friend and foe. In times of disaster, you have, with great sacrifice, protected the world, making it safe, not only for us, but for others. Here at home and abroad, the medical and healing capacity, the care of doctors and nurses has been felt. You, you've been a leader in industry, and the goods you have produced have circled the earth. You've led in technology and science. World leaders have been trained in your universities. Your churches have sent missionaries to the far corners of the earth with good news. And then, and then there's Disneyland. What an incredible land you are. So much bounty, such a blessed place, such opportunity. To the world, the whole nation feels like a wonderland. America, you are our proud and grand home. America, there's no place like it. The earliest Christians to arrive on the shores of this bountiful and beautiful land drew an immediate parallel to the promised land of the Bible. The Lord God is bringing you into a good land, a land of brooks, of water, of fountains and springs flowing out in the hills and valleys, a land of wheat and barley and vines and fig trees, pomegranates, a land of 
olive trees and honey, a land in which you will eat bread without scarcity, in which you will lack nothing, a land whose stones are iron and out of whose hills you can dig copper, and you shall eat and be full, and you shall bless the Lord your God for the good land he has given you. Well, that was a wonderful video. Uh, the blessings of God on the nation of America. Yeah. And uh, it was just absolutely wonderful. All the different things, all the different ways that uh, <laughs> that video just was. No incredible. wonder the whole world wants to come here. Yes, it is so. We're so blessed. And by being blessed, one of the things that we do at our Thanksgiving is we go around the table and we say, what are you thankful for? What are you grateful for? Sometimes it's a little hesitation because they're not ready. So I suggest that you make them make their list before they come to the table and say, I want you to make a list of all the things you're thankful for before you come to the table because we will be asking you for that. And, uh, and they will do. And we, we just have such fun and such love and uh, sometimes it's amazing what children will say they're thankful for, and it's funny. But we pray that God will bless you and that he will make his face shine upon you and give you peace and love and joy and a happy, wonderful family time at your Thanksgiving feast. And even if you're alone, yes. the Lord is with you and his face is shining on you. Blessed, blessed holidays to all of you who are watching Project Pray. God bless you. And we love you. Don't forget that. We love you. Blessings. Blessings.